Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. Dysgenics by Richard Lynn. Chapter 2 Natural Selection in Pre Industrial Societies. The root cause of genetic deterioration of the populations of the Western nations is that natural selection against those with poor health became relaxed, and natural selection against those with low intelligence and poor character ceased to operate during the course of the 19th century. To understand the significance of this development, we need to consider how natural selection worked to keep the populations genetically sound in pre industrial human societies and the dramatic nature of the change that came about when natural selection broke down. This is our concern in the present chapter. 1. General Principles of Natural Selection There are two processes by which natural selection keeps a population genetically sound. These are through the greater tendency of those with genetically superior qualities to survive, the survival of the fittest, and through their higher fertility. Conversely, those with genetically inferior qualities have greater mortality and lower fertility. These two processes apply quite generally for health throughout all animal species. Individuals who lack genetic immunities, or who inherit genetic disorders, tend not to reproduce, either because they are infertile, or because they are physically impaired, or because they make unattractive mates. And to die in infancy or childhood before they have an opportunity to reproduce. Through these mechanisms, the genes responsible for genetic disorders and diseases are constantly eliminated from the population. With regard to intelligence and what the eugenicists called character, natural selection in pre-industrial human societies operated principally through males. It is a general principle throughout animal species that males compete with one another for females. Typically, it is the stronger, more aggressive and healthier males who succeed in these competitions, secure females and consequently transmit their genes for these characteristics to their progeny. Competition between males is generally reinforced by a biologically programmed propensity of females to prefer successful males as mating partners. These principles of natural selection were understood and set out by Darwin in The Descent of Man, where he wrote, quote, It is certain that amongst all animals there is a struggle between the males for possession of the female. Close quote, 1871. Subsequent observations by naturalists were to show that this was right and were synthesized by the Scottish biologist. Wynne Edwards, 1962, who showed that throughout animal species, males compete either for territory or status, and that only those who are successful gain access to females and are able to reproduce. In a number of species of fish, amphibia and birds, competition between males is largely for territory. In any particular locality, there are only a certain number of territories, and this limits the number of males able to obtain them. The males who secure territories are the strongest, the most aggressive, and the healthiest. Females will only mate with males who have obtained territories, and hence only the fittest reproduce. Most mammals are social animals who live in groups and males do not have personal territories. In these species, the males are typically ordered in a status or dominance hierarchy, and only the high-ranking ones have access to females. 
as young males come into adulthood, they compete to secure acceptance as members of the group and, once this is achieved, to gain high status in the hierarchy. Those who are the strongest, most aggressive and healthy are successful and able to secure mates. As human beings evolved from apes over the course of the last five million years or so, males came to need intelligence and character to be successful in competition for status. We can envisage what this competition must have been like among evolving humans by looking at the social organisation of troops of apes and monkeys, and of primitive peoples, and where these are similar, it is likely that the same processes were present in the evolution of humans. Typically apes, monkeys, and human hunter-gatherers live in groups of around 20 to 50 individuals. The males are ordered in status hierarchies in which the higher-ranking males have greater access to females. For longish periods of time, there is no movement in the hierarchy. Then the male at the top falls ill, weakens or dies, and this opens up an opportunity for middle-ranking males to challenge and replace him. The young male seeking to rise in the hierarchy has to make fine judgments and exercise restraint about when to accept his place in the hierarchy and when to challenge it. Those who are too aggressive at too young an age are at risk of being killed or expelled from the troop while those who are too timid fail to move up the hierarchy when niches in the middle and at the top fall vacant. Just how to behave in order to secure an improved position in the hierarchy and eventually reach the top requires both intelligence and character. That syndrome of personality qualities comprising self-discipline, restraint, the capacity to work steadily over a period of many years for long-term goals, the ability to cooperate with others and form political alliances, and the integrity required to gain the approval of colleagues and superiors. Over the periods during which humans evolved, males possessing intelligence and character were more successful in competition for status and, as a consequence, access to females and the genes responsible for these qualities gradually evolved and spread in human populations. 2. Natural Selection Against Disease Throughout the animal kingdom, and in human societies from the first hunter-gatherers to Western societies up to the 19th century, natural selection operated against individuals with poor health and with genetic diseases. Generally, most women had at least four children and frequently many more. But the populations grew only slowly because about half of those born died before they reached adulthood. Those who died young were predominantly those who lacked the genetic immunities against disease, who had poor nutrition, which lowered their resistance to disease, and who had genetic diseases that were incurable. High infant and child mortality kept the population genetically sound in regard to health up to around the year 1800, after which improvements in sanitation and other medical advances led to a reduction in mortality and weakened the impact of natural selection against disease. 3. Hunter-gatherers In addition to natural selection against those with poor health, natural selection has also operated in favour of intelligence and character among the hunter-gatherer peoples who still survive in remote parts of the world, and whose lifestyles have been described by anthropologists. These people live in small groups, like most other primates. Generally, about half to three quarters of the infants born die before they reach adulthood as a result of disease, accidents or warfare, in which the victors kill the defeated. The males in hunter-gatherer peoples are ordered in status hierarchies, as in many mammalian societies, and high-status males have greater reproductive success. This was understood by Darwin, who described it as follows. 
quote, The strongest and most vigorous men, those who could best defend and hunt for their families, and during latter times the chiefs or head men, would have succeeded in leaving a greater average number of offspring than would the weaker, poorer, and lower members of the same tribes. The chiefs of nearly every tribe throughout the world succeeded in obtaining more than one wife. Close quote. 1871, Volume 2, page 368. Subsequent research by anthropologists and biologists has shown that this was correct. Typically, the males in hunter-gatherer societies fall into three bands. First, there is the leader or headman, who has several wives or access to several women, who may include the wives of others. Second, there are males of intermediate status who have one wife. Finally, there are low-status males who have no wives. The result of these social systems is that the leaders have the most children, the intermediate males have a few, while the lower-ranking males have none. Hence, the qualities necessary to secure group leadership are genetically enhanced, and these include health, intelligence, and character. A good description of a hunter-gatherer people with this lifestyle has been given by Neil, 1983, and Chagnon, 1983, of the American Indian Yanomoto of the Upper Amazon Basin. These people live in small groups led by a head man, who has two or three wives, while the other men have one or none. Among a number of these groups, Neil and Chagnon found that head men had an average of 8.6 living children. To become a headman requires intelligence, including good verbal and reasoning abilities to out-talk others and good spatial abilities for effective hunting. As David Buss in a review of studies of these groups observes, quote, In tribal societies, the headmen or leaders are inevitably among the most intelligent in the group. Close quote. 1994, page 34. And success in competition to become a headman also requires the character qualities of self-discipline needed to command the respect and loyalty of the group. Among these hunter-gatherer peoples, there are incessant conflicts between neighbouring groups in which the victors generally kill off the defeated men and boys and take over the women. The groups that succeeded in these conflicts are those with better health, physical strength, intelligence and character, such as the ability to plan ahead, control impulsiveness, and exercise caution. Thus, natural selection operates to strengthen these qualities through conflicts between groups, as well as through competition between males for status within groups. A similar social system has been described by Hill and Kaplan, 1988, among the Aki, an American Indian hunter-gatherer people in Paraguay. Another example of a contemporary hunter-gatherer people with this lifestyle is the Kung San tribes of the Kalahari Desert. They live in small bands and move their camps frequently from one watering hole to another. Howell, 1979, has made a study of them and estimates that 62% of males produce no children. About 45% of children die before they reach adulthood. Mortality is higher among males than among females, so there is an excess of females, and this allows about 5% of the males to have two or more wives. The lifestyle of hunter-gatherers has been reviewed by Murdoch, 1967, and Betzig, 1986, who have shown that the great majority of these people have status-based, polygamous mating systems of this kind. Natural selection operates by differential mortality and by differential fertility in favour of males who are successful in competition for status. This ensures greater reproductive success for males who are healthier, more intelligent, and have stronger character. 4. 
pastoralists and agriculturalists. A number of hunter-gatherer peoples have evolved into migratory pastoralists and settled agriculturalists. Where this has occurred, they continue to practice polygamy. Pastoralists are nomadic peoples who keep domesticated animals, such as goats and camels, and migrate from place to place to find new pastures for their herds. Their diet consists largely of produce from these herds, mainly cheese, milk, and blood, and from time to time the animals which they slaughter for meat. They often trade their animal products for plant foods obtained from settled agricultural peoples. The first pastoralists appeared in Neolithic times, about 10,000 years ago around the shores of the Mediterranean, in the Middle East, Asia, and East Africa. Harrison Ross, 1987. The size of the population that pastoralists can sustain is constrained by the size of their herds. A good description of a typical pastoral people, the Rendile camel herders of northern Kenya, is given by Moran, 1979. These people enforce celibacy on all males up to the age of 31. Once they have attained this age, males are permitted to marry. But to do this, they have to produce a bride price which is paid in camels. Only about 50% of the males are able to accumulate sufficient camels for the required bride price, and those who are unable to do this remain wifeless and childless. Those who are able to accumulate the required number of camels are allowed to buy several wives, if they can afford them. The key to reproduction is, therefore, the ability to accumulate wealth in the form of camels. There can be little doubt that intelligence, character, and ability to exercise restraint and to work for long-term objectives make an important contribution to the acquisition of sufficient camels to buy a wife and have children. A number of pastoral people have settled down to become agriculturalists. Typical peoples of this kind, described by anthropologists, are the Yomot tribes in Iran, described by Irons, 1979, and tribal peoples in Nigeria, Dryzen, 1972, New Guinea, Wood, Johnson and Campbell, 1985, Bangladesh, Sheikh and Becker, 1985, and the Kipsigis in Kenya, Borghoff, Mulder, 1988. Descriptions of over a hundred of these societies have been examined by Betzig, 1986, who concludes that virtually all of them have polygamous mating systems in which the successful men have several wives and therefore greater fertility insofar as intelligence and character contribute to the achievement of social status in human societies, natural selection for these qualities operates among pastoralists and agriculturalists. 5. Early Nation States About 5,000 years ago, the development of agriculture and the domestication of animals became sufficiently advanced to sustain the first nation-states with populous capital cities and surrounding territories. These nation-states arose initially in river valleys where floodplains produced fertile land in which sufficient crops could be grown to feed the urban populations. The first of these states arose in the valleys of the Euphrates, Tigris, Indus, Nile, Ganges, Yangtze, and Huaho rivers. The rise of the nation-state saw the development of a social class system. At the top were the ruling families and the heads of the military, police, religious and administrative structures. Below these was a middle class of officers, administrators and merchants. Next came skilled artisans, and then labourers, domestic servants, soldiers and slaves. 
These early nation-states had polygamous marriage systems of a nature broadly similar to those of the agriculturalist societies from which they evolved. High-ranking males typically had numerous wives or concubines. The Old Testament records that King David had more than a hundred of them, while in Turkey and India royal harems sometimes contained over a thousand women. Among the Incas of Peru, polygamy was regulated by law according to rank. The emperors had as many wives or concubines as they wanted. Military chiefs were allowed 30 wives, and middle-ranking officers were permitted 15, 8, or 7 according to their rank. Betzig, 1986. In China, emperors had many hundreds of women in their harems, whom they systematically serviced on a rotating basis at appropriate times in their menstrual cycles, carefully organised and regulated by female supervisors, and through this system they were able to father several hundred offspring. Dickenman, 1979. The all-time record of reproductive fitness for high-status males is believed to be held by Maule Ismail, the bloodthirsty, a Moroccan emperor who is said to have fathered 888 children. Dalian Wilson, 1983. In addition to the differential fertility in accordance with rank, a second mechanism by which natural selection in early nation-states secured the survival of the fittest was through the better nutrition of the higher social classes. It has been shown in several studies by measuring the lengths of skeletons in high- and low-class graves, that the higher social classes were better nourished. An example of this comes from the Maya, the extinct civilization of Central America, where skeletons in high-class graves average 7 centimeters longer than those in low-class graves. Haviland, 1967. The effects of poor nutrition among the lower social classes would have been to delay menage in adolescent girls, reduce fertility, impair health and resistance to disease, and thereby increase mortality. Fritsch, 1978, Frischanko, Matos and Flegel, 1983, Harrison Ross, 1987. The net effect of these factors would have been a lower rate of reproduction in the lower social classes as compared with the higher. 6. Christendom Christianity was adopted as the official religion of the Roman Empire in the year 314. One of its requirements was monogamy. Just why the Roman emperors and their supporting oligarchy should have wished to institutionalise monogamy is rather curious, because polygamy appears better designed to serve the interests of powerful men. Possibly the advantage of monogamy was that it preserved property rights through inheritance for a small number of the legitimate children. The support of ordinary Christians for monogamy is easier to understand. Christianity is principally a religion of the poor, and the oppressed who receive their reward in heaven for the hardships suffered in their lives on earth. And the poor and oppressed are disadvantaged in polygamous societies because, if powerful men have several wives, there are none left for them. So it is in the interests of the poor and the oppressed that women are shared out equally by monogamy. Whatever the explanation for the institutionalization of monogamy in Christendom, this was the first of the four great blows struck by the Roman Catholic Church against natural selection. The second was the requirement of clerical celibacy which Pope Innocent I imposed about the year 410, and which curtailed the fertility of many able men and women who entered the Church, although it was not always successful in eliminating it entirely. The third was the prohibition of birth control in the 19th and 20th centuries, which made it difficult for the less competent to control their fertility, while the competent found ways of doing so. The fourth was the prohibition of abortion, 
the availability of which reduces the fertility of the less competent who are more prone to unplanned and unwanted pregnancies. In spite of the official institutionalization of monogamy, natural selection continued to operate throughout many centuries for Christendom. Powerful men had extramarital relationships which frequently resulted in children. For kings and aristocrats, mistresses were an accepted part of life. For instance, William the Conqueror, who invaded England in 1066, was the illegitimate son of Robert, Duke of Normandy, and his mistress, Arlette. John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, 1340-1399, had three illegitimate sons. Charles II, King of England in the late 17th century, had 14 illegitimate children, many of whose descendants survive to this day as members of the British aristocracy. In France, Henry II, 1499-1566, had Diane de Poitiers as his mistress. Louis XIV, 1638-1715, to 1715, had Madame de Maintenon and Louis XV, 1715 to 1754, had Madame du Pompadour and Madame du Barry. Even priests and clergy sometimes failed to live up to their vows of celibacy, and it was not unknown for cardinals and even popes to have children. In England, Cardinal Wolsey had a son, and Pope Alexander XI, 1431 to 1503, had four of them. Occasionally, deviant Christian sects persuaded themselves that monogamy was not a requirement of the Christian faith, and that God would look favourably on polygamy. One of these was the 19th century American Mormons, among whom a high-ranking churchman had an average of five wives and 25 children, while the lower ranking had one wife and an average of 6.6 children. Daly and Wilson, 1983. So, in spite of the adoption of monogamy, natural selection continued to operate over many centuries in Christendom. 7. Fertility in Europe, 1500-1850 From around the year 1500, records of births, deaths and marriages were kept in many towns and villages throughout Europe, and these have been analysed by historical demographers to ascertain the degree to which people controlled their fertility and whether there were socio-economic status differences in mortality fertility, and the number of children surviving to adulthood. As far as the control of fertility is concerned, the evidence for the period 1500 to about 1880 indicates that in general there was no significant control over fertility among those who were married. These had natural fertility, that is to say fertility unrestricted by any methods designed to limit it. The presence of natural fertility can be measured by examination of the degree to which women's fertility declines after the age of 30. When couples limit their fertility, they generally have their desired number of children while the wife is in her 20s and curtail the number born thereafter. This is known as parity-specific fertility, because once a specific parity, number of children, has been achieved, couples control further fertility. In conditions of natural fertility, wives continue to bear children up to the early to mid-40s. Hence, by examination of the degree to which fertility declines after the age of 30, it is possible to estimate whether fertility is being controlled. This estimate is made by calculation of the statistic M. Where M equals zero, fertility is natural. Where M is above 0.2, there is some degree of fertility control. And when M equals 1, fertility control is predominant. Values of M have been calculated for England from 1550 to 1850 and are virtually zero throughout this period. Wilson, 1982. 
Data for other countries are summarised by Cole, 1986. Zero values for M have been obtained for Germany for the period 1750 to 1825, for Norway for 1878 to 1880, and for Sweden for 1871 to 1880. There is, therefore, widespread evidence that natural fertility was generally present in Europe up to the last quarter of the 19th century. There are, however, some exceptions to this generalisation. A number of studies have shown that there was some degree of fertility control among the nobility, the professional classes and the bourgeoisie in several European countries from the late 17th century onwards. France was unique because natural fertility started to be controlled quite widely in the population from around the year 1800, some 80 years ahead of the rest of Europe. These exceptions constitute the beginnings of the control over fertility, which spread throughout the populations of the economically developed world from around 1880 onwards. Although there was generally prevailing natural fertility among married couples in Europe during the period 1500 to 1880, apart from the exceptions just noted, the fertility of the total population was kept between four and five children per woman and was therefore significantly below its potential of around eight children per woman. Total fertility rates for a number of historical Western populations have been estimated by Cole, 1986. In 18th century Europe, these ranged from 4.1 in Denmark and 4.2 in Norway, to 4.5 in Sweden and 4.7 in Britain. Substantially higher total fertility rates have been recorded for other populations, such as 6.3 in India for 1906, and 7 for the United States in 1800. Total fertility rates in Europe were kept at moderate levels by three principal means. These were a relatively late age of marriage, which reduced the number of children of married women, a high proportion of people who never married, and strong social control over extramarital relations among the lower classes. The age of marriage was typically in the late 20s for men and the mid-20s for women from the 16th to the 19th centuries. There were strong social pressures preventing people from marrying unless they had a livelihood and a house in which to live and rear a family. Many of those who were unable to find a house and a livelihood found employment as domestic servants. There was an absolute prohibition on these marrying and retaining their positions, and as a consequence many of them remained celibate and childless throughout their lives. Ringley and Schofield, 1981. There were also powerful social pressures against sexual relations outside marriage. The strength of these in New England in the 17th century was described by Nathaniel Hawthorne in his novel, the Scarlet Letter, in which a woman who commits adultery is ostracised and required to wear a shaming red letter A for adulteress on her dress for the remainder of her life. In some European countries, social ostracism of extramarital sexuality was reinforced by the criminal law. In Britain in the mid-17th century, adultery by a married woman was made a capital offence, and fornication was punishable by imprisonment, although these activities were decriminalised after the Restoration in 1660. B.T. 1986. In Sweden, adultery and fornication were punished by flogging, imprisonment and substantial fines from the beginning of the 1600s to the end of the 1800s, and it was not until 1937 that adultery was formally decriminalised. These sanctions were sufficiently powerful to exercise a strong deterrent effect on extramarital sexual activity, to the extent that illegitimacy was kept to approximately 5% of births 
from the early 1600s through to around 1950 in Britain, Sweden, most of continental Europe, and the United States, Coleman and Salt, 1992, Sundin, 1992, Murray, 1994. Because these social controls operated principally on the lower classes, they had considerable success in checking the fertility of the least competent members of the population. 8. Socioeconomic Differentials in Reproductive Fitness Natural selection worked in favour of intelligence and character in historical times through social class differences in the number of children born and surviving to adulthood, and hence able to have children of their own. Both of these factors determine reproductive fitness. We assume for the time being that the upper and middle classes were superior in regard to intelligence and character than the lower classes, as numerous studies in the 20th century and, and reviewed in chapters 11 and 13 have shown. If this was so, the greater reproductive fitness of the upper and middle classes shows the presence of positive natural selection for intelligence and character. The earliest records showing a lower mortality and higher fertility among higher social classes came from Italy for the 15th century. With regard to mortality, Morrison, Krishna and Molha, 1977, have shown that young women in Florence who received large dowries on marriage in the years 1425 to 1442 lived longer than those who received small dowries. There is similar data for fertility reported for Tuscany for the year 1427 by Herlihy, 1965, who has found a positive association between family wealth and the number of children in households. The wealthiest families had more than twice as many living children as the poorest. Historical demographers have shown that in Europe from the 16th to the 18th centuries, the upper and middle classes had higher fertility and a greater number of children surviving to adulthood than the lower classes. Some illustrative statistics from England and Germany are shown in Table 2.1 for middle class, working class differences. Notice that the middle classes had an advantage of between 50 and 100% in these measures of reproductive fitness. The higher socioeconomic classes also had an advantage in lower mortality. Some statistics for average age of death in Switzerland, France and Germany in the 18th century have been calculated by Schultz, 1991. Her results are shown in Table 2.2. The upper class consists of aristocrats, professionals, senior civil servants, wealthy merchants and landowners, the middle class of teachers, shopkeepers, small merchants and so forth, and the working class of skilled and unskilled artisans and servants. Note that the upper class had a longer life expectancy than the middle class, and these had a longer life expectancy than the working class. Since the average age of death was in the early to mid-twenties, many people died too young to have children, especially in the working class. There is similar historical evidence from Japan for a positive association between socioeconomic status and fertility. Hayami, 1980, divides the population into three classes and estimates that in the 18th and first half of the 19th centuries, class 1 had 5.6 children, class 2 had 3.9 children, and class 3 had 3.7 children. There were three major factors responsible for the higher mortality and lower fertility of the lower socioeconomic classes in historical times. These were, first, the use of infanticide and abortion which are estimated to have been relatively widespread in pre-industrial Europe, Coleman and Salt, 1992, and in Japan, Hayami, 1980, and which were more prevalent among the poorer classes who were less able to afford to rear children. Second, 
the strong social controls preventing marriage for those without livelihoods and on sexual relations outside marriage, which reduces the fertility of the lowest classes, and third, the higher infant and child mortality of the lowest classes resulting from poor nutrition and greater exposure to disease, resulting from overcrowded and unsanitary living conditions. The effect of poor nutrition on infant mortality has been shown in the 20th century in a study of the effect of the Dutch famine from 1944 to 1945. The food intake in Western Holland was reduced to about 1,400 calories per day, approximately half of the populations of economically developed nations in the 20th century. The result was an approximately threefold increase in infant mortality as compared with 1939, Lummi and Van Poppel, 1994. Even a 10 to 15 percent weight loss in young women delays menarche and causes amenorrhea, which reduce fertility, Fritsch, 1984. These factors together operated to keep the reproductive fitness of the upper middle classes substantially greater than that of the working classes. 9. Social mobility in pre-industrial societies. The inference that the greater reproductive fitness of the upper and middle classes, as compared with the lower classes, in historical times promoted natural selection for intelligence and character, depends upon the assumption that there was a social class gradient for these qualities. It is difficult to prove this conclusively, but there is strong circumstantial evidence for believing that it was the case. In any society where there is social mobility, those born with the qualities needed for upward social mobility tend to rise in the social hierarchy, while those born deficient in these qualities tend to fall. In all human societies, the qualities for upward social mobility are intelligence and character. This was first recognised by Galton, who proposed that achievements depended on ability and character qualities which he described as zeal or eagerness to work, and capacity, or the power of working, 1869, pages 78 to 79. Galton believed that anyone born with ability and zeal and capacity would rise in the social hierarchy. In the 20th century, this formulation has become widely accepted in the social sciences. Michael Young, 1958, in his book, The Rise of Mediocrity, proposed the formula IQ plus motivation equals merit, and merits determine socioeconomic status. Later, Jensen, 1980, page 241, rephrased the formula as aptitude times motivation times opportunity equals achievement. There is a great deal of evidence in support of these formulas, which is reviewed in chapters 11 and 13, and for the conclusion that both intelligence, work motivation, and what Galton called character are substantially under genetic control, which is reviewed in chapters 5 and 13. It was argued by Galton and later by Roland Fisher that in any society where there is social mobility, the social classes will become to some degree, genetically differentiated for intelligence, work motivation and other character qualities that determine social position. Fisher puts this as follows in a letter written to E.B. Wilson in 1930 and quoted by Bennett, 1983, page 272. Quote, if desirable characters, intelligence, enterprise, understanding our fellow men, capacity to arouse their admiration or confidence, exert any advantage, then it follows that they will become correlated with social class. The more thoroughly we carry out the democratic programme of giving equal opportunity to talent wherever it is found, 
the more thoroughly we ensure that genetic class differences in eugenic value shall be built up. Close quote. The argument of Galton and Fisher that in any society where there is social mobility, the social classes must become genetically differentiated was restated in 1971 by Richard Herrnstein in his book IQ in the Meritocracy. Herrnstein put the argument in the form of a syllogism, the terms of which were 1. If differences in mental ability are inherited, uh, 2. If success in the socio-economic hierarchy depends on these abilities, then three, social class differences will be based to some extent on genetic differences in these abilities. Herrnstein called this the spectre of meritocracy. What he meant was that through social mobility, the genes for high intelligence had come to be concentrated in the professional and middle classes and the genes for low intelligence to be concentrated in the lower classes. Hernstein's syllogism showed that logically this must be the case, granted the two premises on which the syllogism was based. The argument applies equally strongly to the motivation and character contribution to social mobility. The crucial question is, therefore, whether there was any social mobility in historical times. The classical work on this issue was written by Hitirim Sorokin, who surveyed a large number of historical societies and concluded that there has never been a society where there has been no mobility across social classes. The nearest approach to a zero-mobility society was the Indian caste system, but even that was occasionally penetrable. Apart from this, quote, there has scarcely been any society whose strata were absolutely closed or in which vertical mobility was not present, close quote. 1927, page 139. Sorokin showed in detail that in numerous societies throughout history, gifted individuals rose in the social hierarchy and the ungifted fell. This was particularly the case during times of social change and disorder, which opened up opportunities for social advancement that were seized by talented individuals. For instance, in England in the 16th century, the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII provided opportunities to buy up the buildings and land, and in the 17th century, the Civil War provided further opportunities to buy up the estates of the royalists. In the 18th century, there was a great expansion of the middle class, consisting of lawyers, army and navy officers, civil servants, bankers, merchants and manufacturers, described in detail by Stone and Stone, 1986, and which continued to grow in the 19th century. Similarly, in France, the revolution of 1789 was followed by the execution of many of the nobility and expropriation of their estates opening up buying opportunities, and the creation of a new officer class and nobility by Napoleon. The economist historian S.J. Paling, 1992, concluded that there was significant social mobility in Europe from at least the 14th century. He described five routes by which talented young men from ordinary families moved up the social hierarchy. These were by becoming successful merchants, civil servants such as tax collectors and administrators, lawyers, army and navy officers, and clergymen. Women were also socially mobile and moved up if they made an advantageous marriages and down if their marriages were disadvantageous. Quantitative studies of the extent of social mobility have been made for the early 19th century. For instance, in Berlin in 1825, 20% of the men with working-class fathers entered middle-class occupations. Kael 1985, page 12. The existence and extent of social mobility has also been shown in pre-industrial China. From the 2nd century BC, the Chinese operated a system of 
competitive examinations for entry into the elite corps of Mandarin administrators, who governed the country and who enjoyed high social status. The examinations were difficult, and success in them required intensive study for several years in universities. A description of the system has been provided by Bowman, 1989. At least from the 14th century onward, there was a nationwide scholarship system which enabled poor but intelligent and well-motivated young men to attend the universities and work for entry to the Mandarinate, and this provided a path of upward social mobility for able ad adolescents from all social classes. The family origins of 10,463 mandarins between the years 1371 and 1904 have been analysed by Ho, 1958. He found that 31% came from ordinary families, none of whose members had had degrees or offices for the three preceding generations. 63% of mandarins came from the middle class and professional families, and the remaining 6% came from what were called distinguished families, which had produced several mandarins. The results show that most highly talented individuals in China came from the middle and professional classes, and this was an open elite which was maintained in each generation by recruiting into its ranks highly talented individuals from the lower classes. Thus, for many centuries in Europe and China, there has been significant social mobility in which talented individuals moved up the social hierarchy, and the untalented moved down. These talented individuals in the higher social classes had greater reproductive fitness. Natural selection was working. 10. High mortality of illegitimates A further way in which natural selection operated against low intelligence and weak character in historical times was by the exceptionally high mortality of illegitimate children. In spite of the strong social controls over extramarital sexual relations in Western nations until the mid-20th century, a small percentage of illegitimate births occurred. It is a reasonable inference that these were predominantly born to parents of low intelligence and weak character. There is direct evidence for this in studies carried out in the late 20th century which have shown that women who have illegitimate children are predominantly of below-average intelligence, poorly educated, psychopathic, and of low socioeconomic status. Hernstein and Murray, 1994, calculate that in the United States, white, single welfare mothers have an average, or an average IQ of 92, as compared with 105 for those who are childless or are married with children. Women with less than a high school education are over 20 times more likely to have an illegitimate child than college-educated women. Rindfus, Bumpass and John, 1980. Sexual promiscuity is one of the central features of the psychopathic personality, the extreme form of weak character and likely in historical times to result in illegitimate children. It is easy to understand why single mothers tend to have low intelligence and weak character. They are less able to foresee, and they care less about, the adverse consequences of having an illegitimate child. These consequences were much more severe in historical times than in the late 20th century and it can be reasonably assumed that women who had illegitimate children and the men who fathered these illegitimate children were predominantly those of low intelligence and weak character, as they are today. Of course, not all of the parents of illegitimate children were of this kind. Intelligent women not infrequently became the mistresses of kings, aristocrats, cardinals, and the wealthy. They were making a shrewd career move, and their children were generally supported by their powerful fathers. But these were the exceptions. 
In historical times, the state did not provide single mothers with welfare, incomes and housing, as it has come to do in Western nations in the second half of the 20th century. Single mothers generally abandoned their babies, and these generally died. In classical Rome, illegitimate and unwanted babies were put in the sewers, and anyone who wanted one had a large choice at their disposal. Dill, 1898. In later centuries in Europe, illegitimate and unwanted babies were abandoned in any convenient place, and up to the middle of the 19th century it was not unusual to see dead babies in the streets and on rubbish dumps. Coleman and Salt, 1992. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the number of abandoned babies was so great in many European cities that orphanages were established to care for them. In Paris, the Hospice des Enfants Trouves was founded for this purpose in 1670 and took in several thousand babies a year, and in London, the Thomas Coram Hospital was established for the same purpose in 1741. The death rate in these orphanages was high. In the Thomas Coram Hospital, it is estimated that 71% of the children died by the age of 15, as compared with around 50% of the general population. The principal reason for the high mortality of the babies was that not enough wet nurses could be found for them, so they were inadequately nourished and particularly vulnerable to infectious disease. Thus, in historical societies, illegitimate children, born predominantly to parents with low intelligence and weak character, suffered high mortality. It was a cruel world, but it was a world in which the genes for low intelligence and weak character were constantly being expelled from the gene pool. 11. Conclusions Natural selection operated in human societies up to the middle of the 19th century. Among the most primitive hunter-gatherer tribes, among pastoralists and agriculturalists, in the early nation-states and in Christendom, fertility and mortality were much higher than was needed for replacement. Disease culled those with poor health and low social status and curtailed their fertility on an extensive scale. There has always been social mobility in all human societies, through which those with intelligence and character, consisting particularly of the motivation and capacity for sustained work, have risen in the social hierarchy. Those deficient in those qualities have fallen. Because intelligence and character are both significantly under genetic control, the reproductive fitness of the leaders and of the upper and middle classes ensured the operation of positive natural selection for these qualities over many centuries and millennia. It was not until the second half of the 19th century that natural selection broke down. How and why this occurred are the questions to which we turn next. <laughs>